we were these broken people trying to change the system. So I suppressed the feelings and I suppressed the memory, but my body was remembering. But if we deprive ourselves from pleasure, fun, enjoyment, forget to drink water, you're not going to show any good sides of you. When you start listening to our episode today, you'll hear the gentle sound of the sea and some birdsong in the background. That's because our guest today is dialing in from a beach in Kenya. Dr. Leila Hussein, OBE, is probably best known as an activist around female genital mutilation. She is also an entrepreneur, a psychotherapist, the rector of St. Andrews University, and probably another 50 different things. Most importantly, she identifies as a change maker. During our conversation, we explore how Leila has dealt with her emotional well-being throughout her life and what this means across the different parts of her journey, be it the trauma of a young girl subjected to FGM, an undiagnosed depression as a child, the stress and anxiety that comes from building and running businesses, or the lack of emotional support as an activist. There are a lot of similarities between the experience of an activist in the field and a business builder. A lot of it boils down to only being able to help others when you're well yourself. We'll learn that for Leila, it's important that you surround yourself with people who hold you accountable, who will speak the truth. Leila is very vocal about the importance to make time for pleasure, to do things that are enjoyable. And we also learn what she calls her support bra. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to head over to Apple or Spotify and rate Naked. It only takes a couple of clicks and it really helps us on our mission to create a healthier space for entrepreneurs. Please meet Leila. This is Naked by the Future Farm, where entrepreneurship is stripped to its vulnerable core. Brought to you by Vladi Meshko Brestinska and Nectarius Liolius. And remember, subscribe, follow and rate Naked to help share it with the world. Welcome Leila. Welcome to Naked by the Future Farm. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm, 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 today's a good day. <laughs> today's a good oh, day. I like that. Yeah, step today's step. a good day. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's been such difficult times, so you have to check in every day. You're like, today's a good day. Yeah. Mm. Hi, Vladi. So how are you? Hey, guys. I'm good. I was very excited about this conversation, or I am. I am. Um, <laughs> And it's it's beautiful. So we have another part of the world now on the podcast. So Leila, you are in Kenya. Kenya. Where specifically mm-hmm. in Kenya? I'm in uh, Melindi town. It's uh, oh. really beautiful. If you get a chance, Google it, Melindi. It's, uh, and actually it's becoming uh, a space where a lot of African entrepreneurs have to flung to after COVID. But I'll talk about that actually. That's, what, okay. that's how I ended up. Maybe it's a good question. You know, I can talk about why I actually ended up in Melindi currently. Yeah. Yeah. No, that I'm curious. I'm curious. Um, so, but yeah, back to you, Nectarius, to fire this. Yeah, up. I, li- I like it. We were like one minute <laughs> in, and our guest is telling us what question we should be asking. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I can imagine. I was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Leila Hussein, OBE, um, we're very, very grateful that you could make the time. We don't often get people who have an academic recognition and letters behind the name. So I'm really kind of psyched. Uh, also, because we're quite curious about some of this, right? Um, mm. Your background has so many different facets, your life uh, as, an, as an activist, as an entrepreneur, as an academic, as a human rights advocate, uh, but also somebody who has a very interesting personal journey. Mm. Um, so we're quite keen to let this go in whichever direction it goes, always through the lens that is important to us, which is on the one side, mental and emotional well-being for entrepreneurs and the other side what can we do to change the system mm-hmm. right yeah um, maybe Leila just sorry Nick, I'm just feeling that it might be good to also share with Leila and the guys who are listening to us they will know because we've sort of touched base on this before but you know when we talk about entrepreneur what is very important for us is to sort of expand the definition so we were very keen to have you also mm-hmm. for exploring the relationship between the activism advocates mm-hmm. human rights advocates and their journey and whether the entrepreneurial mindset is what they also have so then hence sort of the roller coaster is present so that just to say yeah but but back well, to you again next time. 
there's a there's a, there's, there's, there's a whole story on that. <laughs> yeah. So, if somebody asks you today to introduce yourself, what is the main hook? Because we all have different hats. What's the favorite hat? Oh is it director of St Andrews University? Because that's a that's an odd one in your CV. That's not that's something somebody. Odd... <laughs> when someone asks me, so what? So like, what? What do you do? And 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 by the way, my family as well. They said we don't know what to say to people because you wear so many hats. Uh, I used to have anxiety about it, but now I'm actually very proud of it. I think I don't think anyone. I could never have done one thing, and I've always been like that since I was a kid. I guess. If I had to use one word, it's change maker. I think the ch changing systems, say changing approaches, uh, changing uh, 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 environment. You know, I'm also a creator, so I like creating environments. So for me, if there was one word to describe me, that's um, you know, I I I like shaking things up. I've been called troublemaker a few times. And I and I proudly wear that. Um, mm. I guess when you want when you're when you're trying to make change, you are seen as a troublemaker because you know you're coming into a space and now telling people I don't think this actually works, and people hate change. And as a therapist, as a psychotherapist, I know that as well. But I've learned how to create an environment where I can get people to start changing their mindset or try to get them to understand maybe we should think about a bit of change. So if I had to call myself anything i think a change maker it will be um fundamental that's everything i do comes back to that yeah yeah i think probably people pe because you have a public profile people probably most likely know you because you're kind of the work you've done for fgm right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um where was the point between you've been very vocal about having been through the experience yeah. yourself what was the point between going through the experience and then decided you know what I have to do something about it. Nobody else will. Yeah. yeah. So for me, it was my, uh, the, the change really was out of anger. There was anger involved in that change. I think, uh, by the way, you would say, I'm going to always connect, bring it back to emotions because I think emotions really have a way of, of getting you to that next. Uh, so it was anger out of, so just picture this. So I grew up in the West most of my life, went to the, you know, British, I went to an Italian school, British school, Uh, but none of the establishments has taught me about my body as a woman. So I didn't know my organs, for example, right? 21, I have my daughter. For the first time, someone actually asks me that question. Can I check if you've undergone this practice? My response was, of course I did. I didn't have the worst type though, because you know, I didn't have a problem having sex or urinating. Already there was an alarm bell that I thought this was okay because if, if mm. I go back a little bit, I don't know how my body looks like. No one told me about anyone not touching my body. 21, I have a three months old in my hand and someone's finally telling me, oh, did you know this is actually illegal? Did you know this part of your body should not be missing? So I'm literally sitting there in front of a nurse who's finally educating me about what's happened to me. And it's the way she did it that was really profound. It wasn't judgmental. She was educating me. She wasn't tiptoeing around the subject. She told me it was illegal. And she, it was the first person that said to me, actually, what you went through was child abuse. And where the big connection really happened, she said to me, what was your pregnancy like? I said, oh, it was horrible. I had that condition where you couldn't keep food in. So I was in and out of hospital for the whole nine months. But I said, and then she goes, what was birth like? I said, oh. That was also horrible. You know, I had a horrible experience, but I said, but I said it wasn't the giving the birth or the labor. It was being examined. Vaginally being examined was the mm. worst experience for me. And she was the first person to tell me it, the reason that was, because I would literally black out every time I was vaginally examined. So I avoided smear testing for years. And I still, it's still a big issue for me. She said, your body was remembering the trauma you experienced. So I suppressed the feelings and I suppressed the memory but my body was remembering. That's why my body would go into shock every time I was being examined. And that's when I realized, oh, my body experienced abuse. So what my body does, it automatically protects itself by shutting down because it was so traumatic. But I didn't even make that connection. Mm. And then it was something, there was one word she used. She said, if you are thinking about doing this to your daughter or even contemplating, 
you are a potential perpetrator of violence. And as a parent being told you could be a perpetrator of violence, that's mm. when the shift really happens. So mm. I was educated without tiptoeing the subject. Because I keep using that. I'm going to keep coming back to that word. She was very direct. And that's where the shift happened. Because for me, I walked out of that room. And by the way, she, she invited me three times. I walked out of that room, educated, not feeling judged. My daughter being protected, but also recognizing it wasn't just about FGM. I left with the question, why was I cut? And that anger kicked in. So there was anger towards my family and the community that did this to me, but anger towards my school and anger towards my midwife who never brought it up with me. So it was anger <laughs> that shifted that this, 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 um, uh, from being just a young mom who was having a baby to coming to this stepping in. It was really the anger, but it was also brought up in a family where you questioned everything. So I was already had that training, I guess, for my family, my parents, when we had dinner at home, it was encouraged that we debated about stuff, which my mom now says it backfired on her because, you know, she's like, oh, she goes, Layla, you know, uh, she calls me her curious child. She goes, she's too curious. They gave you. That's a no? gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of, of course. Yeah. Mm. Except obviously she didn't think, <laughs> you know, I was going to ask about vaginas. You know, there was, there was a limit to the curiosity. I think she wanted to talk about science and maths and I wish know, politics. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> all of a sudden, I was like, wait a minute. Why is that part of my body being taken off? Mm. What was the reason? So it was really, that's what started that shift for me. I know that Vladi has questions, but just before we go there, because you I just the, threw in. You know, like yeah, I'm like I, anxious as an energy right now. I'm just, just conscious that I mentioned FGM, but we didn't explain what it is. Do you mm, mind? Mm. You probably are much better at explaining it in a succinct way, what it stands for and what it does. Yeah, yeah. So female genital mutilation. I keep using the word practice. I don't want to use the word practice. It's violence committed by women and children where the female genitalia is partially or totally removed. And for the majority of the women, the remaining skin is pulled together, stitched from top to bottom, and left with a very small opening. Sometimes not even a matchstick can get through. You're expected to urinate, menstruate, have intercourse, and give birth at some point. So you can just imagine the complications you are suffering from the moment that happens. You know, women suffer from, uh, uh, when, it, when it first happens, you know, a lot of girls die from this. They have severe bleeding, uh, urine, urine retention, you know, because usually when we urinate, it's a message that's sent to our brain that tells us we need to go and pee. But there's a, actually, when you go through it, there's a disconnect. Literally, the body goes into a severe trauma where you're disconnected from that message going to your brain. So a lot of girls are accumulating your urine for a few days and they have to be taken back to the hospital and then expected to have sex uh when they get married remember they be they've been mutilated because so they can be remain virgins so now i mean as as, as i'm describing this i really wanted to see the the fact that women are objects you're an object that's been closed and now been opened mm. for business really when when we say women are uh, an object that's a great example of literally her genitalia is closed and then open for her to have sex with her husband and then expect to give birth. But you can imagine the re-experiences of that trauma over and over and over. And I remember, listen, there's, there's a reason, and I've been very public about this, there's a reason why I had one child because it was so traumatic. Uh, the pregnancy, the giving birth, the aftercare, I mean, it was super traumatic. It's not worth me having another child again. Like I, I can be very honest about it, mm. but that's how severe, that's how it damages uh, uh, women. And but it's done to children. That's the thing I want people to remember. Um, majority of the time, it happens when they babies. You know, from some communities, it's from a uh, few days old to a few months old. The most common age group, it's from four to seven. Uh, but we know also, like in countries like Kenya, it happens to teenagers. Uh, we know in some other countries it happens when they are uh, during their, the night of their marriage to the day she's given birth. Um, there are communities who believe, you know, you have to remove the clitoris before the baby comes out. Can you imagine telling the mother the baby's going to die if the clitoris touches the baby's head? So as a mom, you cut your arm off for your child. So it's that kind of conditioning. And, you know, in terms of reasoning, you know, people say it's their culture, religion, you know, social mm. norm. But fundamentally... What a female genital mutilation is, it's child abuse, it's serious sexual assault, 
but it's there to control the female body and sexuality. That's where it is. It's not culture. Yeah. It's not religion. But but tell me where in the world we're not trying to control female sexuality. You know, I mean, there are so many things, and I and I think Leila, we need like days for this. But what the reason I'm saying that, and I want I want your listeners to understand because people feel FGM is so far away, but fundamentally, it's about control of female sexuality. Mm. Where in the world we're not trying to control females? We just we just packaged it in different ways. That's mm. the only difference. Mm. Yeah, and also the thing that um, I remember where first time I came across um, the practice and started educate ed- educating myself, um, mm. I realized that a lot of us sort of thought like it's connected to the Muslim communities that are even geographically far away. You know, and a lot of people thought, oh sort of connected it with, with uh, African continent. And then you sort of realize when you go deeper and you educate yourself, that's not true at all, right? That's that not it's, true. Yeah, it's, it's not true. It yeah. happens in Asia. Mm. FGM happens in Asia. We recently have stats. Uh, there's actually, the Guardian UK did a whole long different pieces in different parts of the world where FGM happens. Russia, Colombia, many parts of the Middle East. Uh, it's practiced across all religions. It's practiced amongst uh, Muslims, Christians, Ethiopians are, there's a massive Ethiopian Jewish community. You know, the Jewish people do practices now. And we're not going to say now just because the Ethiopians are no longer Jewish. And, and I've had people argue with me about this. I'm like, but they're Jewish. So it means Jewish people are practicing FGM. So it was important to, to remember that it's practical across all religions. It's practical across non believers. Like in Kenya, the Maasai community doesn't have a specific religion. You know, they, they believe in nature. That's, that's what they believe in. So, mm. but fundamentally, what all these religions and beliefs all come under, it's a patriarchal system that says women should be controlled. That's, that's the one religion they're all practicing. That, and I'm constantly trying to name every platform I go to. I go, can we talk about patriarchy? Because that's a religion, <laughs> that's the universal one that everybody's practicing. You know, well, we you have, can all pretend have... you have different gods, but you all, <laughs> you all have the same belief called patriarchy. <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny because ultimately our goal is to talk about emotional well-being but every conversation we have on the podcast touches upon questioning the capitalistic infrastructure we operate under and to some extent the patriarchy so i'm i'm quite amused by this that it always comes back to that um sorry vladi i barged yeah. in yeah no no i mean I, i'm just thinking about what you're saying because it makes a lot of sense and you know now being here in pakistan i mean the stories we could share right and and i mean it just relates on so many levels um but I want to bring it back to you, Leila. So, and, and first of all, thank you for this, also for the education, because it's very important. And so, so the education awareness, one. Second, so the sort of the experience that you shared where you faced sort of the, for the first time, the reality where it, the, the, the nurse told you and you said it in the way that was straightforward, direct, she was not tiptoeing, right? Um, yeah. What happens in one's mind and the emotional state to be able to work with the anger to transforming into a power for change because i think that's also what a lot of our entrepreneurs can relate to so you so how, how did that anger transform into power yeah yeah by the way i didn't even know i was an activist until a journalist called me this but yeah i think that's also something for, to, to mention i I was asking a lot of questions. I already mm-hmm. knew very early on I had privilege. When I lived in London, I knew I lived in a country where I can ask questions and I was not going to be killed. <laughs> well, I did get death threats, by the way, but it was the, the government was not going to come after me in such a way. Like I know if I was in Somalia, that would have been different. So I guess I recognized my power. Early. The power for me was there are girls or young mums like me out there and they deserve similar uh, 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 information. Just let's give people the information I got because I I cannot tell you right now if she didn't intervene, what I would have done to my daughter. I really I, I, because I haven't made those connections. I would have thought, oh yeah, just cutting her a little bit, you know, doing type one as they call it, you know, a little snippet, it's fine. Never would have thought touch someone touching her genitalia is already abuse. I I, I wasn't in that state of mind to have that education to me what drove me 
and dra- drives me till now. One, we need to actually educate people on 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 their rights. So, on because this might get us a bit off track a little bit. But how many times have you heard? Or if in order to empower women, we need education. You hear that all the time. My question is, what the hell is in that book we keep telling women to educate from? If you don't know your rights, you don't know your body autonomy. How how are we protecting people? So for me, that is that was my experience. So my aim was, I just want what I had for everybody else to have. Why isn't this information out there? So I use my position. So I end up working with that nurse, by the way. I end up volunteering with her for a bit. Uh, and a, a job as a youth outreach worker came up. I I had to shape this whole role. Like it was shaping, actually not realizing my my uh, entrepreneurism skills started back then because I had mm. to shape this role and create this whole new space that didn't exist back then. Um, so for me, it was, I need the, every young woman or every mother out there or any, all of us should have, but also it was the education system needs to change. Why hasn't my bloody school in London taught me about my own body? Did not teach me about sex or healthy relationship. Listen, the UK education system, I can say out really loud, it's toxic. It's anti-women, it's anti-human being in, in general. That's just my, I, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm raising, I raised a daughter, she's 18 now, who's on a spectrum evil evil education system so it this is there to destroy so for me and and my my um my journey till now is that that has to change <laughs> and yeah. and i guess i'm using my position as a therapist to make that change you know the change maker comes in it's like something uh, just saying fgm is wrong is not enough we need to understand. So I guess my power, I don't know how to, I'm trying to respond to that question uh, in a simple way, but the power comes in different waves and, and I hold different spaces in that as well. So for me, it's the education system. Uh, our health system also plays a role. Um, I actually, because of what happened to me, I ended up working with the Royal College of Midwifery till now. I still work with them because I use my trauma with them, my anger towards them, but instead of being angry about it, one thing I've learned early on in my leadership work, complain, you know, do complain about a system, but make sure you also have a space to, to talk about solutions. That stayed with me. And I learned that in Senegal a couple of years ago, where I was told, do you hate this institution who has very big power? Don't complain about them. Go in there. You try to change that system. And if you can't change it, come out, you create the system. So I'm always very mindful of that, always, always. So that that's that's always been the 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 I guess the powerful position. That's mm. where I went from being angry. So and the, the Royal College of Midwifery that was that was literally how that was used. I was really angry at my midwife. She could clearly see how the scar mm. and didn't say a word. But what I realized that midwife also held these patriarchal systems. Or, you know, the British behavior. Oh, we don't get involved in people's cultures, you know, behavior. So it wasn't about me. It was her fear that stopped her from giving me the right, the right care. And that has to be addressed. And that, in order for that to happen, the system has to change. I don't know about you, Nick but I'm seeing so many similarities between the <laughs> sort of mental health cause in the, in the world of change makers and entrepreneurs and uh, the leaders. I love Leila, the, like the, the bit around systemic change resonates big time, right? And the focus yeah. on also see the solutions, right? If it's yeah. not possible, build a system, alternative system. Um, I love the scale, because you were, you didn't use the word, but you said, I was curious how I actually can bring this to all the women and, and girls and the wider society. So that's how entrepreneur thinks, right? Most of them is like, how can I sort of yeah. bring this in scale? Um, and I love the using the position of privilege um, to actually you know, impact something and, and have a cause and be mindful of that, be aware of that, be self-reflective. Um, I have plenty of questions, but I'm going to put the ball to, to Nick Darius. <laughs> no, <clears throat> I think the, the, the one question that's been coming through, it's kind of funny because you talk about y- your life, Leila, and you just throw in these things that you, you do. 
And it's not things that you've done, things that you do. So I do keep wondering all the time, how many jobs do you actually have? But that's a different story. But <laughs> there, there, there is, it's like, oh, I'm working with this institution. And it's, another life, it's, it's another life of an, of a, of an entrepreneur. <laughs> the, Lots the, of jobs. <laughs> so um, by the way, the thing you said about, I had to build it myself because nobody else would. That's oh. the thing we see it with most entrepreneurs that that, that we talk, right? Now, the, the one thing for me, um, also because of the things we, we particularly care about is in your journey. So you had this conversation with your nurse. You realized something fundamental mm. had happened. At what point do you actually recognize this as a, as a mental health thing? At what point do you actually right. find a vocabulary yeah. to say, you know what? This wasn't just something that happened to me physically it is actually something that affected my mental and emotional yeah and what do you really do with that? no really uh her, by the way her name is jennifer Bourne. jennifer Bourne was a nurse and a psychotherapist so i was very lucky uh the universe brought me to her never heard the word flashback so she used the term your body consistently has flashback she goes you suppressed these memories i genuinely suppressed them because I've never talked about it till this point. But she said, over the years, what's been happening though, you might have suppressed those feelings and memory, but your body was telling you, you're trying to ignore this. You need to deal with it. And that really led me to the conversation about me. I didn't even know I had mental health issues. Actually, through her, I realized I was actually, uh, I was a teenager who had serious severe depression, but just no one picked up on it because I did, there was no the vocab my school didn't talk about mental health at home. We're African family, you know, who are refugees. We were lucky we were alive. So no one had time to talk about mental health issues. <laughs> there was no time for that. Mm. So, you know, you have food, you have roof, your parents are alive, your family is good. You don't, you don't talk about, I mean, how, the, how, how dare you even have mental health? That's the environment I grew up in. So for the first time, someone actually said, so for me, it was, but you know, that really led me Again, because I, so in the community, when I came out and said, you know, I've undergone this, I was told, but what do you know about FGM? You didn't have the worst type. You were not totally closed. So my story became, maybe physically I wasn't so damaged, but psychologically I was damaged as any other woman. Because I could see, like I would watch, there's a TV show called Doctors that comes on 2 p.m. in the UK, right? You know, when you're watching that, you're at home either sick, you know, working, because it's usually a time when everybody should be working, right? <laughs> And there was a scene, I'll never forget, a woman was having a smear test done. She's having a conversation with her nurse. And I remember thinking, that's so alien to me, so far away, so far away. That is not my experience. And I spoke to my friends who haven't undergone alcohol. Is that, they're like, yeah, usually we just have a quick conversation while we're having us. I'm like, this is so alien to me. To me, it's the worst thing that can happen to me worse I'd rather someone just cut my arm with a with a blade because that seems less painful so I really wanted to unpack this so Jen, Jennifer who I ended up working with said you know I think it's important you're in therapy and actually Jennifer played a role in my work around well-being in terms of doing this so because she early on while I started working with her has implemented supervision for me so I had to have super supervision during my time of working with with her with her and her team because she said to me Layla, you are talking about something you experience every day. This is going to trigger you. If you're going to do mm. this work properly, I'm going to have to implement supervision. So every month I had supervisor, but also insisted. Actually, uh, I'll never forget. She said to me, you're not coming back to work until you go back to therapy. And I'm, that was, it saved my life because there was a shame around therapy. And going into therapy has really shaped, one made me understand what I went through was child abuse. It was sexual assault. Now I have to really unpack all of this, recognizing my mother played a role in this. <laughs> all of a sudden, I'm mad at my mom. Anyway, I really enjoyed the whole process. Ended up, I, I wasn't even planning to be a, a therapist. I wanted to do some basic training on how to listen because I was coming across a lot of women and girls in this clinic. I go, let me go and shape up my listening skills. I think it's important. It was supposed to be a six-week course. Long story short, four years of training as a psychotherapist. And, but while training, you have to be in therapy. But what I recognize, so this is when you're creating your, when something's not there, do it yourself. So when you train as a therapist, yeah. you have to be in therapy. It's part of your training. But guess what keeps, keeps happening? Because I went to two, I think I had to change therapist two or three times. I have to do like a PowerPoint presentation where FGM is, which is very exhausting. 
I'm constantly trying to explain who my community is. So I founded Dahlia Project in 2013. I, qualif- I qualified in 2010, but the idea of Dahlia started in 2006. <laughs> Even I found in 2013, but the idea is when I started training as a therapist, which is 2006. I'm working on this idea of this clinic. I wanted a clinic where women like me could walk in. They don't have to explain what FGM is. All they have to do is unpack the violence, you know, the, 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 the trauma this has caused for them. And that's it. Meaning everybody from the receptionist to the clinical manager, everybody had to be trained. So I created this. It was for me because I didn't get to have it. And that's how Dali was born. <laughs> My first ever, and I, I mean, I was my own therapist at the beginning, my own admin, as you do with any, any time, whenever you have an idea for yourself, but now I have yeah. a whole team running it. But that was my work around mental health really started. And it was also recognizing mental health doesn't come in one shape. You really have to look at um, everybody individually. So we, Dali became a place for support groups because support groups, I found, I wasn't, when you, when you go from something like FGM, you feel very isolated in your stories. So I wanted to create a support group. But what we also did in our support groups, it's support group had its own need. So I love bespoke approach in, in mental health. We cannot brush everybody with the same brush. We just can't do that. Everybody had to be, the individual therapy it was individual approach for me mental health well-being it's recognizing that person's need and delivering it for them not me telling them this is what I think you need mm. and, and 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 the women you know and they and the women work together in terms of how they want to finish that group when they finish their 12 week they wanted they were trying wanted a tea ceremony and we like to incorporate their cultures but it's within their choice not again because what we do in the world of psych- the world of psychotherapy I've been training is very white <laughs> it's very European and I had to create now a space. Again, it was for me and my mother and my mom's friends, a space where they felt comfortable to come to. So that's what I meant in terms of creating your own space. But well-being goes a bit deeper than just offering a counseling service. It's really mm-hmm. looking at, and, and at Dali, we constantly check. What, what do we need? We actually have session. We, we meet with a group of our women at least two, three times a week, two, two, two three times a year just to check what's missing. What do you, what do we need? What do we need to do better? It's really important, especially as a founder, you really have to hear that. Uh, your ideas are not necessarily great at the beginning, but you know, that's what I learned. You know, this yeah. is so amazing to hear because uh, what you were actually describing, I was just making sort of like mental notes here. And um, the one that I made was inclusive design, customer centric design, right? So those are sort of, yes, maybe buzzwords in the entrepreneurial sort of world but it's awesome to hear that you you've been building a movement and you're integrating the sort of the 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 process and the principles the retrospectives that you talked about um the the support groups uh nectars and i talked before we started recording is that we want to sort of deep dive into that because what we seen around us in the mental health space um, for entrepreneurs and and we also have our own experiences with it is designing that space of psychological safety that is indeed designed according to the needs of the group right so so um you are mindful for that is a powerful tool so Absolutely. what have you yeah what have you seen there in terms of uh the the peer group and what can you know our audience listeners learn from that experience in terms of if they're considering joining some of those um talking to their peer entrepreneurs um yeah well, well, I, mean, I, I, I guess i guess i guess there. what i what i what i found i ended up in the community of activists and what i had one of, one of the things i so i then again again there's a need i guess the, the theme with me is <laughs> what did layla need is everything i created um so as an activist, what I realized early on, you know, we are constantly being attacked online, physically. You know, I had to move home three, four times, security issues. That has an impact on you mentally, has an impact on you financially. So I, so in 2000, and again, the ideas begin in traumatic times. So 2016 was one of the worst difficult years for me. And it was like, I wanted to merge the role of activism 
and mental well-being because that was not being talked about at all. And then realizing in the world of international development, z- zero. Mm. Actually, what I recognized, including myself, we were these broken people trying to change the system. We're in these amazing activists on, you know, on stage, but behind closed doors, we are literally broken human beings. We are burnt out. And actually, I thought, wait a minute, wouldn't it be great if I use my therapy, you know, psychotherapist skills by teaching and basic listening? Remember the one I wanted to go on at the beginning? What if I just created a basic emotional well-being tools for activists? And that's because I went to my peers. That's why I'm coming back to the entrepreneur space. My peers at the beginning were the activists. So that's the group I went to and recognizing, hey, guys, uh, actually, let's check. Uh, how many hours are you sleeping? How many hours are you spending? How, how were you actually even breathing? I remember part of this module, <laughs> we got a yoga instructor to come oh, yeah. and teach about breathing exercises because mm-hmm. breathing mm-hmm. has a massive impact on our well-being, how we, so getting them to really, it was just basic, but, Basics. but the impact it had really, uh, if I die, I want to be remembered for that work because to watch a, 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 an activist in Kenya, in a village, who now t- two, three years later after developing that, emails me and says, oh, Leila, you don't understand. I constantly go back to my work because what we do at the end, they had a, 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 a care plan they had to do their individual care and they had to map this out because I said, you have to, I'm a visual person. I need to see it. Let's start visualizing. And he says, literally every three months, he, he does a check-in with himself and he goes, what it, what it, what it's done for them. It's actually remembering well-being is so important. The aim wasn't even just about the tools. It's recognizing this is part of your life. It's like literally drinking water. It's how you have to carry your mental well-being mm-hmm. and changing, changing, that 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 state of mind to me that's a great outcome which led me to now meeting entrepreneurs literally realizing they're doing the same thing all broken people with great ideas (laughs) (laughs) but what they're forgetting is themselves and the environment so i have to constantly check my environment whenever i'm doing something if I know things are getting dark in my mind, I need to step back in a little bit. But you need to teach people for that to, to do that as well. People literally need to be taught. You need to take a five-minute walk. You need to have lunch, not next to your desk. People need to be told this. Mm. <laughs> so it's basic things like that. Um, but well-being is also something that's ongoing. You know, mm. COVID, we had to re- go back and relook at this again. Uh, what that meant for all of us. Um, yeah, sorry, I just kept going. Well, that no, that's all right. No, that's okay. It's 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 yeah. it's not even that we try to interrupt because <laughs> it's mm. just amazing listening to you. That there is something when you were describing Dahlia uh, that sounded so familiar because even the entrepreneurs, the founders we talk to, they go, you know what? I recognize I need to talk to somebody, but I don't want to talk. Go to a, a counselor mm. who doesn't understand the entrepreneurial world and doesn't understand what the term sheet is. It doesn't understand what it means to have co-founder problems, right? So for them, it's it's having an environment where people know your language. So you come in and you don't have to go through that is important. So that that resonated. Uh, the other thing that resonated a lot was very much like, and again, it's it's just fascinating to see that it comes through no matter which which part of the, the the pie you kind of address is, is I don't want to talk to specialists. I want to talk to peers. I want to talk to people who go through the same thing. That in itself is already a good start, right? So those peer conversations, that's why we're so interested in that. It's also something we hear a lot. And there isn't much out there for the founder of a tech startup who wants to talk about stuff because it's either geographically too close or it, maybe it's competitive and you want it to be mm. safe and it comes mm. with an additional level of of, of complexity, right? But I think it's wonderful the way for you, the way you describe it, it just all falls into place. It's like the one thing led to another thing to another thing, and you cover the whole range of things that 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 need addressing. So I'm yeah. I'm wow. So Vlad is waiting. I'm what I'm, I'm you, to- yeah. <laughs> no, but I've been enjoying the reflection. Um and I was also, to be honest, reflecting on my system support system when you were saying about the basics, and I see you drinking the water and I'm here with my water. No, no. And I Me did too. not I have, have the lunch today. 
you know, and I rushed to the, to the uh, recording and my co-founders were like, have the lunch, you have to have the lunch. And it's like, you know, yeah, yeah, we compromise it. It's true. It's true. And I think every day as we started the podcast, right, it's like so. every day reminding yourself. So Leila, what's your support system? Like what's, what's in the toolkit? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I have a, this really funny term. Um, I, I call my support my support system, my support bra. You know, when you get good support bra, it's it, it makes life support so much bra. easier. Support bra, I love my that. support okay. bra, okay. my support bra team. Because <laughs> support bras, <laughs> listen, <laughs> I'm I'm a woman of a particular shape. Mm. I always struggle to find the right bras. When I find the right one, it makes life so much better. <laughs> really. <laughs> So you my know, support like, team. You can have a club for that. <laughs> Literally, a, I call them my support bra team. Yeah. Um, and it consists of different people. Mm. One, it's people who hold me accountable. So this is my core team who work with me. I don't hire people who are the yes people. That's not my team. I'm, and, and it's ongoing conversation, by the way. I'm like, you need to tell me. I know I'm the boss. I know I'm the founder. I hired you so you can tell me when I'm doing shit work or I'm doing the wrong stuff. That's why I hired mm. I think that founders really need to make, really constantly need to keep coming back to that because I think that's how you take care of yourself as well as a founder because then people are just not saying yes to you just for the sake of it because I, that's very important to me. And then my support system is also my uh, uh, pleasure time, which is my friends, my family, having time for my activities that I enjoy. It's so important, uh, and 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 especially when I talk to activists, when I when I say to them, "What's your favorite food?" they look at me crazy because no one asks. Because the idea of talking about food, it's like, "Oh my god, we shouldn't be talking about this." That doesn't sound very smart. I'm like, "No, what do you do?" I go for me two things I check in my in my support system. Uh, am I sleeping? Uh, am I getting my tasks done? That means with my team, and it's their pleasure. And I use the word pleasure because pleasure means a whole different thing. Pleasure, it's food time with my friends, uh, 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 Layla's physical pleasure. That can be seen in different ways. I think it's important to have that conversation openly because it's part of my mental well-being. I really, especially when I work with women, uh, activists or founders, I end up, I'm like, when was the last time you had physical touch? And yeah. it's like, and it's like, oh, I've been locked in in this house for the last seven months. I got physical touch is part of our healing. It's part of our well-being. Who hugged you? When was the last time you got a hug? When was so? And 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 for me, it's pushing it. So for me, my well-being, my support system, it's looking at those aspects. My my team who tell me the truth, and I keep that safe space for, for them to do that. My friends and family who also hold me accountable. I've had friends who did interventions with me because they, they have, they have, the permission to do that because I know myself. I can just keep going. They have the permission to come in and say, uh, I think you need to go to sleep for two days. My current PA, when I hired her, I blatantly told her, I said, I need someone to actually look after me. I need someone to make sure I have breaks in my calendar. I need someone to make sure uh, I don't have any meetings at a particular time. Boom. I try, and I try to put things in, she removes them. Because she knows I gave her the permission to do that. So it's important to have those open conversations with your support. So support system comes in different ways. But I really would like to stress the word pleasure. It's really important. We need to have fun. We need to enjoy ourselves. Because I think that really has an impact on how, uh, 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 I think what the, the energy we exceed, yeah, like we, we, we expose, mm -hmm. is the, how it mm -hmm. show up is mm -hmm. so important. But if we deprive ourselves from pleasure, fun, enjoyment, forget to drink water, you're not going to show any good sides of you. I mean, you're, you're one dehydrated and tired and exhausted. Um, and I'll give an example. Yesterday, I wasn't having, that's what I said earlier today, I'm having a good day. Yesterday, I sensed my energy was not good. I sensed it. I didn't pretend it wasn't happening. I thought, let me see, let me get through the cause. And I can sense it wasn't going well. <laughs> I said, cancel all my afternoon meetings. I said, I said I'm not used to anybody. If I come okay. with a smooth and I just took myself out. I went for a swim. I, I love music. I just started dancing and just listening to music. Uh, went for a walk. I am literally the beach is a minute walk. I went for a walk. I needed that sea breeze. I like good coffee. Got my so I went into 
a place of being kind to myself. That was very important. Mm. The moment things get very negative, because if I just continue to push, I'm going to, I'm going to collapse and burn out. And I'm very open with myself as well. Literally, I said to her, I said, Leonie, I'm, 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 I'm heading to an anxiety. I don't, I don't want to do that. Cancel my afternoon meetings. I'm not going to be no use to anybody. We need to normalize these conversations, especially if you're the boss. Empowering. Yeah, it can be. If you're hard. the boss, yeah. I, I literally, when I worked with organizations, I tell the management, the directors, the founders, you have to amplify and you have to role model uh, 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 that practice. Yeah. Because if my colleagues don't see me being vulnerable and have a bad day, then I'm setting the wrong goals. I'm telling everybody to be perfect all the time. Uh, I was talking to a founder last Friday who was introduced mm. to me because he was going through a difficult time and it was a friend of a friend. And, and he's mm. really in the, in the valley, in the deepest pit of the valley of, of a mental health crisis. And, and I asked him who he talks about, what he's going through. And he said, nobody. My team can't know. My investors can't know. And he, and he wasn't in a place where he was even open or able to consider opening up, right? So for you to be able to say that is a really strong statement. Hopefully it encourages people to show that mm. vulnerability actually works in your favor because it normalizes you and it dehumanizes you, it humanizes you and Absolutely. it gives you, um, and it's so wonderful. We, we, this is, I mean, you use the word normalize, right? And ultimately we use, we use normalization and destigmatizing mm. of some of these conversations, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Leila, so you are driving this systemic change from different places. Mm-hmm. And we sort of live through through this ourselves with Nectaris and our team. I'm seeing every day number of entrepreneurs that have a cause they devoted their life to and want to drive it from a systemic lens. Mm-hmm. What do you feel are sort of the essentials for that movement to be to be effective? Like, what is it, everything that needs to be sort of considered? And I know that this maybe is the theoretical question, but I, yeah. I'm asking because I know that you, you, you use also the power of the word and the narrative, right? You write for a lot of media. I mean, you have an organization that is focused on intervention. So you sort of come in, in different places of the value chain or, 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 or how do you sort of drive the movement? So what, what, what are your thoughts? What's sort of a, experience learning the learned experience from your own journey i mean currently working on this africa-led movement hence why i'm in actually in kenya what i've learned being involved in this process um it's one to check your ego that you're not the one with the answers all the time i think it's bringing uh the right partners together is important who who can fit who can who can provide that level of expertise the areas that you don't have so for me, that's really uh, important because um, usually founders get in that space of the ego where, you know, I'm, I know what's best. And actually what I learned as a, as, a, as, a, as, as a founder, as someone who's led teams, is actually getting a team that makes me look great. <laughs> really? I think, I think with any movement, I think it's recognizing if we, we were creating a whole brand new movement right now, as a founder who I, I want this new movement. So what what's the first I think of? Like, hmm, what do what 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 outcome do I want from this? A, B, C. Who can provide A for me? Who can provide B for me? So for me, actually working, bringing your your team together, it's key, super key. But in that space, you need to put your you need to check your ego all the time. We all have ego, by the way. It's 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 a normal human, you know reaction but it's constantly checking it um but trust i know this sounds this might sound very cheesy i think trust is very key when 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 um in terms of approach because there's nothing worse when you're trying to achieve something or currently i'm 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 part of the team who's supporting an existing movement and actually one of my colleagues said to me you know we've got this big meeting coming up in april what do you want to achieve i said i want us to achieve a level of trust within because we've got there's six organizations working together. We need to. I say, if we get that, if we have a level of trust yeah. between us, everything will fall into place. And mm. to do that, you have to do the work, especially I'm part of the team that's leading this consortium right now. So I, and we need to set the tone in a lead up to this meeting in April. 
that we are a trusting we are we are facilitating a trusting space so to me that's really key i mean listen quick just i didn't even know i was the social entrepreneur into someone said it to me because i worked in a space of development and it was only two two three years ago it was it was david uh, rowan who was the founder of wide magazine who i met in different spaces and then someone else who said Alila, you know you're a social entrepreneur and i'm like oh i thought that was a whole different uh uh that was a whole different ball game i didn't know i was doing that so mm. sometimes you don't even know that that these these na- these these titles so i felt for a while i didn't even belong even though i was in these spaces but somehow i didn't even have the right terminology for it um uh, because i never made the connection because in my mind a social entrepreneur someone who went to a business school you know who developed who might have worked in microsoft at some point like it's it's that so it's great that we're retelling these stories in different ways now mm. um but you need someone to step in as well to say hey actually did you know this is what you're actually doing i'm like oh and then it was it was david rowan who invited me to that whole space where i met julia then mateo then to you so it's 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 important so now i step in for people who don't even know that they're in that space mm. and did you know this is what you're doing <laughs> and, but you know what I, i sometimes feel like the words are I mean are so limiting in terms of the boxes yeah. they put us in because even now Leila when you said like he told you you're a social entrepreneur so my whole body reacted because I was like no no she's an entrepreneur yeah. or she's yeah. a change yeah. agent who uses yeah. she has yeah. an entrepreneurial mindset to what she yeah. does and yeah. how she runs it so um yeah. but um Leila I I love the fact that we actually sort of ended on this note because I I you know from my space where i sit here in lahore on this on this chair um i i i do reflect on you know you, how you s- sort of named yourself and when you said like what what do i do i'm a change agent or change maker um and i and i feel that it so very much reflects a lot of entrepreneurs journey um and i've been really enjoying this conversation for so thank you for not tiptoeing and for the straightforwardness <laughs> thank you No, we Thank really, you know, really appreciate you. the vulnerability, mm. the, the mm. putting things on the table and talking about them because it's part of the normalizing and the destigmatizing, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm also super excited about the second, the second part of this because we will come back to you now that you're in our family. <laughs> It's <you>. like, <laughs> but so thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, guys, you, for having me as well. Thank you. Join us next week to reflect and digest. You've been listening to Naked by the Future Farm, where entrepreneurship is stripped to its vulnerable core. To learn more about our work, sign up to our newsletter or visit thefuturefarm.co, where you can also apply to be a Naked guest. Naked is produced by Dan Terzel and edited by Catherine Walker. And remember, subscribe, follow, and rate Naked to help share it with the world.